Although this book is tragic, it's not downbeat. I knew from doing this job, from living in Africa, that the book did not have to be wrist-slashingly depressing because, we're, look, we're talking about 28 million people with uh, a treatable, preventable illness who are nonetheless at risk of imminent death because they're not getting access to that treatment or that prevention. So is that an incredibly grave story? Yes. That said, uh, I know from doing this job, the people that I spend time with all the time, that it is also, um, it's a story of incredible uh, resilience and compassion and resourcefulness and uh, creativity and that, you know, the people that, I, that a lot of the people in this book who I've come to call friends live in these incredibly challenging, grim circumstances and still manage to be people who are filled with hope and uh, filled with resilience. And so I thought, well, if I can tell those stories, then the book is not in and of itself necessarily going to be completely depressing. You know, I often talk about the young women that I meet in places like Malawi or Zambia who, on the surface, could not have lives more different than mine. Like they live in grass houses and they walk 10 kilometers every day to get firewood and they have seven kids and they're the third or fourth wife of a miner who works away in South Africa, right? Like, no comparison. But when I ask them, when I ask them to tell me their stories and they tell me about going down to the clinic and sitting down in a little room and the nurse who took the piece of paper and said, actually, you've got HIV, and knowing that that was invisible, there's no sign of it on your body at that moment, but you're actually going to die, this thing is going to slowly and insidiously take over your body and then kill you, um, that doesn't feel any different in Malawi than it would feel if it happened to me today in Toronto. And, and those people are, in fact, uh, you know, we look at their lives, I think sometimes we think Africa, right, and we're like, oh, Africa, the wars, famines, droughts, disasters. All these things, AIDS is just one more, and uh, and and we think that somehow people feel differently. It's like, oh, oh, great, oh, I have AIDS. Well, I already had all these other problems anyway. So, uh, you know, we don't actually think that. In fact, these people have aspirations, and they want to see their grandchildren, and they want to build a business, and um, they want to graduate from high school. Like that, they have want all the same things that we want. That they're not that different. And so it was the process of trying to convey all those, in fact, ways that were exactly the same. I'm starting to sound a bit like we are the world here or a, a Disney ride or something, right? But um, the, the process, that process of making those people real that would, uh, that would make the pandemic real in a way that the statistics are just never going to do. And 28 is a nice number. I mean, 28 is it's like the number of people I have on Facebook. I mean, that sounds really shallow, but it's, it's a number of people it's that... It's graspable. I think 20, it's, it's, it's enough. It's about like barely the number that you can kind of keep in your head. Um, and I also thought, well, people aren't going to know. Not everyone is going to resonate with every reader, right? Uh, every reader is going to bring to this a certain number of things that they're interested in or, or experiences they've had in the past. And so probably there will be four or five people who really stand out for you. Um, you know, if you're a granny, then maybe the story of Regine, who was left at the age of 76, which is old anywhere, but really old in Zambia. She's left raising 13 of her grandchildren because all but one of her own children have died. Um, you know, I think you can be, you know, you can sit in Moose Jaw or, or Halifax and think, wow, if, like all my kids died and all of their kids were put on the bus back to me and I suddenly found myself with 13 kids living in my house. You know, I think that that's something that that, um, that might, you know, that's going to, even though Regina's life is very different, again, I think that that's an experience that we can kind of imagine happening to us. You really have a very wide cross-section of, of people. I mean, people who have AIDS and people who don't. Mm -hmm. Infected or affected, they say in Africa, and there isn't anybody who isn't one or the other. And then there are people who are both, like the nurse. Mm -hmm. Tell me about her. Her name is Alice Kazanja, and she works in a clinic in Zomba in Malawi. And uh, roughly one in six people in Zomba has HIV. It's incredibly poor. Uh, and Alice works in a hospital. It's a 350-bed hospital uh, that's always at 300% capacity. So that means people on the floor, people on the bed, people on the stairwells. Um, and she's one of three or four nurses in that entire hospital. Um, she was infected by her husband, who was pretty blatantly unfaithful. Um, and But rather than doing what almost all of her colleagues have done, which is keep the secret out of shame and fear and embarrassment, um, Alice worked in, was just really proactive and, and determined about getting access to treatment herself, which she did. Spent almost every penny of her salary on treatment before it was free, but it kept her alive through those couple crucial years until it, the drugs were made available free by the Malawi government. Um, and then was recruited 
to go work in an AIDS clinic. A really interesting thing, actually. It's an AIDS clinic founded by a Canadian organization called Dignitas. And when she first went to work there, she was still keeping her secret, but she was going to you know, work with pe getting people on treatment. And finally, one day, she said very nervously to this young Canadian doctor, like, I, I think that you should also know that I have HIV, and kind of braced herself for his reaction, wondering would he be disapproving, would he think less of her, would he think it wasn't appropriate for her to work there. And he said, fantastic, you're going to be our best advertisement. And he put her in charge of going in front of people and saying, I have HIV, and this is what these drugs for me, and if you did for me, and if you take these drugs every morning and every evening, you're going to look like me, and there's no reason for you to die, and no reason for your kids to die, and you don't need to be ashamed or afraid anymore because you can be healthy like me. And I think he had a perception that Alice would be a good ad, but didn't quite realize the time I spent with Alice. She's, she has the taxi driver by the collar, and she's saying to him, look at you. I can tell you have HIV. You're getting sick. Get in that clinic. And she's, she's guiding people on the road. She's kind of yanking people off their bikes as they're going by. Get in there and test for HIV. I mean, she's, just, she's a woman possessed at this point. She's been given her life back when she didn't expect it, and she sees she's not going to let anybody on her watch die who doesn't have to. She's totally inspiring. I hope if you go back and look at this again, that it's a smaller number than 28 and it's not 35, or God forbid it's 280. Yeah, yeah no, me too. The sequel. Yeah. yeah. I hope it's called Three. That'd be nice. The book is 28 Stories of AIDS in Africa. I'm speaking with the author Stephanie Nolan and 28, published by Knopf Canada.